Oh, okay. Yeah, then uh, we can keep on yeah. going. All-purpose saw. Yeah. <coughs> Here, you can put that in your loafer. <laughs> I found it in the parking lot. Oh, okay. <laughs> put it on the tracks and have a train run over it. <laughs> yeah. You probably never did that. You were never a little boy. No, I was, I was never. a little boy thing. We always put pennies on the tracks. A freight train right over. <laughs> I, I didn't live. Never heard about doing that? No. Oh, yeah, every little boy has done that. What? That scared mom to death, wasn't it? Well, yes. <laughs> 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 but you would know that there was a train coming before you. Oh, you, you're you aware of a freight train coming down the tracks when you're standing yeah. about five feet away. Oh, yeah, you're yeah. very aware you of that. You won't do it when the train is coming down. Yeah, we used to have two or three of my baby guns in this town. I know. Yeah. Uh, they weren't here when I came. No. I, they weren't? Were they? I'm thinking they were. Uh, not for too long after we started here coming, after we were here. Okay. A little while. They got rid of one line, though. <laughs> See, the CNW was here late. Talking about trains. Tracks. Talking about putting a penny and on the uh, railroad tracks to flatten it out. There was another out. line that came through. This was a cross, oh. crossroads. And I don't remember when it left. Was that a happy day when it left or not? No, it's never a happy day when you lose something lose, in a town. I think so, too. Just piece by piece, and it's just kind of, huh. Yeah. But sometimes people don't like the noise. And it's just one thing, one close. less thing, and it's just not, never. I don't, I don't see that as ever a good thing. Well, if you were a young child, you would love the train. Oh, we did. We yeah. put pennies on the on the rails and, and then back up. And vroom, vroom, vroom. Yeah. Oh, it's just terrifying to stand about five feet away from a freight train barreling down. No kidding. Ooh. Yeah, but it, it, it just you like to do it. Yeah, when you're that age. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I was that age of uh, counting the number of cars that were on the train. That was one of the things that passed the time. So that was fun. Yeah. We didn't have. Did you? We, were were freight trains coming through or here when you were a boy? No. No. no just he's talking uh, about trip. going to Iowa City. There was over in Albion. There was a oh, truck. just waiting yeah. in the car. Yeah. yeah, waiting in the car and counting the, the cars go by. Yeah. The, the so attachments yeah. and all. <laughs> but when you're 11 years old and you're standing five feet away from a freight train going about 50 mile an hour, that's that's fun. <laughs> <laughs> Wind gust. We we said we thought his mother might not have thought that. She probably mothers, did. Mothers don't right. know those things. <laughs> and to be real honest, mothers don't want to know those things. <laughs> I think they do. They want to get yeah, their, their child home. Uh, they tell them that's too close. Maybe that's a father thing. Because I, I told my kids, I said, They're just, you don't need to tell me everything. There's things I'd rather not know. <laughs> That's probably a father thing. Yeah, if it's already done. I don't think it's a mother thing. Well, okay. <laughs> That's probably why fathers are a lot happier. Maybe. <laughs> oh, happy day. <laughs> Ignorance is bliss. Uh, okay. <laughs> now, there's something about just standing so close to something so powerful and it just makes you feel alive i know it just well, really that's is. a good that's a good um link into being close to god that's where it comes from well that's what i mean that's where it comes. a dog won't do that a dog will run as far as he can away from a freight train it's only 10 year old boys that are just <laughs> like a magnet and if your buddy's standing five feet away, you'll stand four. And it's a, then it's a game of chicken. <laughs> but
but there's something about just being in the vicinity of it, just an uncontrolled power that it 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 is controlled, but it it's just awesome, and well, it makes you feel so alive. Well, just connect that to. I do. Our, that our that that's Bible. that's a big mark of my life, Carolyn. It really is. Mm. That's marked my life ever since I was a little boy. Mm. That's why I well. Well, last week we were down in Oklahoma shooting machine guns mm -hmm. and biggest machine gun shoot in the United States. And it's just something about being that close to something that powerful and, and uh, controlled chaos that just, just makes you feel alive. <laughs> and I, I, yeah, that's, that's marked my life. This is totally, I spent a lot of time near to uh, rail station, a lot rail of the station because we have is a, a Transsibirsk magistrate and I said in Russian because train went from our city to Pekin, mm. uh, China. Mm -hmm. So if you see nice, you stay like you said, no long way from a, a train, no right. long way because it's you're on a platform there. Yeah, because it's like the train is come here, it is like a little like down, down. Okay. Yes, uh -huh. So we stay like here, no long time. And <laughs> you like that too? Yes, and we see because the train was very, very nice. It went to China, went to China. Wow. So it was very, very nice window, and different, different evening time, and different, different lamp. We will uh, light. It was amazing. Okay, a long time, maybe until eighth grade. Yeah. Always have been. But and did it make you just feel alive? Yes, alive and a little, a little scary because it's noise in power. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Luba. Yes, <laughs> and my my time. No, now I think no. We went for rail. Rail, what is it? Mm -hmm. For railroad, yeah. we're walking. And we see a uh, train coming. Mm. Coming. <laughs> yeah. so you think you might have outgrown that? I never did. Well, he did it. I never did, did it. outgrow that. We always went, 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 did it. But we're still alive. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. But five inches away? Five. Feet. 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 Oh. No, inches, oh, okay. inches. Okay. Which is, I you just have going to have nerves of steel okay, to be that, five inches away. Okay. It's wind. <laughs> you won't want to be that close. That probably wouldn't be. Oh, yeah. Well, there were some of the kids I hung around with in that age group that were probably dumb enough to do that, but we probably wouldn't allow them. Good. Good. Okay, that makes me feel a lot better. That's, that's five feet. That's not so bad. Well, try it. Well, I had an aunt that. That's about the the width of the table here. Yeah, yeah. try it. Five feet. Well, mm -hmm. I I did. I have an aunt that I had an aunt that that lived right had a where the train went by her home, and we always my brother and I always were happy when it was coming. Yeah. But. My folks would say, now, don't get too close. And I didn't want to get too close. But you were drawn to it. Yes, I am. That's my point. Well, that's okay. Then. That's my point. That's something uniquely human, I really think. Because if you had a dog there, he'd have run away. He don't want to be close to that thing. He it's, won't chase it. Huh? He won't chase it. He doesn't want it. He wouldn't sit there five feet away from it and, and wait for and, it to come <laughs> and just be excited when it watching it go by like yeah. a, like an eleven year old boy or girl. Yeah. 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 Well, I can remember walking. So that that's there too, again so. that's something that we when we're made in God's image we 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 sense that 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 we we want to be close to some something like that something bigger mm -hmm. than us and. Mm -hmm more powerful than us and, and something that could just squish us like a penny. Mm -hmm. But we're safe because we're standing five feet away. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. It, it, but 
but yeah, the, but our it just makes you feel so much alive. You can feel it on the inside, can't you? Yeah. It, well, you can. It, well, yeah, the ground's you, moving. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> you can and feel the, it. The noise and everything. Yeah. 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 Like I said I've I've never outgrown that that sense of wonder and awe at that, that something like that, something of power. On the way home, Denny told me that he loves, he heard that he loves to dig in the dirt like I do. And, and he heard that, that someone told him that God, God says, you should go out and put your hands in the dirt every day because it gives you a different feeling and you will it, it will increase the joy of your life and and then we talked about it for a while and he said Also, science has discovered that when you do that, there's something that is in the earth that comes into the body. It's called grounding. Tell me about it. Well, I don't know a whole lot about it, but it, it's... It's why you should walk walk barefoot yeah. in the grass. Yeah. And and it's good for you. It calms your body. Healthy. Yeah. Healthy and not just yeah. up here in the brain thinking, but getting closer to reality of the earth and mm -hmm. we thought it was the original. God is wanting us to Feel that closeness mm -hmm. to what his creation is. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Are we ready to go? I don't know. I'm gonna before you pray. I'm just gonna shut that door. So. Yes. I wasn't sure we were meeting tonight. Who did you ask? Well, I sent an email out Friday and said I wasn't sure we were meeting tonight. We found the answer to that. Yeah, Debbie's and said, I think so. Right, though. Kyle, he's taping everything. And so oh, he my. Pulled up, pulled up one, the last one we had, and he said right there, June 30th. With Peter. Well, that's fine. That's, I, didn't, I didn't remember. I don't remember a lot. Well, I didn't write it down, and if it doesn't get written down, I... Well, that's why I sent an email out, because I knew Carolyn probably wrote it down. <laughs> I don't know if she did or not. Yep. But then I knew Becky was going to be at that wedding it yesterday. Says, Next so I, meeting, I, 6.30, and that's circled. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't think she was going to be there. And then Lisa said she was going to be gone. And you never know about Luba. I can play <laughs> day. I can play day. <laughs> Oh, I'm I'm teasing you, Luba. I, I like to I like to tease. It, do we have a few minutes for Luba to tell you what she's been doing? Do you want to share what you've been? Oh yes, doing? I took the good children of Chicago. Two you boys, did. Yes, two boys. Yes, um, Pastor Michael and Jacob from here. Yeah. Sixteen, uh, fifteen, and sixteen years old. They behave amazing. It was nice. Three, uh, three nights and four days. It was very nice. So we saw Chicago. And I, I, I like to show in them Chicago because Chicago life is very different from our life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I ask, for me, it's no, I don't like it at all. But the boy said, oh, it's okay. We have energy from this city. It's okay. But it's like, no, it's, uh, what can I need to say? I have been second time, a second time in Chicago, but it's like on the building, you know, fre it's fresh, it's air, but 
no natural life, I need to say. Mm -hmm. So, so uh -huh, we, Did you uh, go to the field museum? And, yes, we went to field museum. Okay. The and, aquarium? And, yes. Good. And we went for uh, history museum. Natural history museum. And uh, yes, and we went for peel on a uh, boat, and different, different museum, every day, different museum. It was nice. So yes, it was very nice. Did the boys like that? Yes, boys like that. They did? Oh. Yes, but only one reason, because one is 16, a second is 15, my Christine. We can, uh, I should to be with them in room. I cannot be separate. Oh. So, but I uh, talk, 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 and said I need to sleep somewhere. So they give me big, big, big sofa. I took with me my uh, uh, quilt, mm. and I said, boys, you going on bed. I'm going to sofa because yeah. your first time is, yeah, it's, uh, we have nice food because a child, mm -hmm. boys like to eat. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. and they was happy and we came back. Uh, and after we came back, we came back on Thursday and on uh, Friday, 11 o'clock, we fly in Tennessee back. Oh, okay. Oh, I spent time one week in Tennessee. <laughs> wow. Because Mike has musical uh, camp. And it was a very nice performance. I stayed. And I came in Friday and said, I am home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Boys was very, very happy. Yeah. Well, I decided to say right. boys. It's, it's a, it will be nice memory about me. Mm -hmm. Because memory know about money, maybe no. know about food. No. Memory is like something new, to see something new. And, and I talked, and the uh, new hotel, the hotel was no in Chicago, but the hotel was nice, 25 miles from Chicago, near to Chicago, but around uh, near to uh, hotel was amazing, amazing park, mm -hmm. Century Park, four big, 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 big lakes, super, super nice. Mm -hmm. I went, I went five o'clock because I, Oh, lake! I went downstairs. Ask, do you have lake around? They said yes. So I went 10 o'clock p.m. Watch, and uh, 5 p.m. I woke up and uh, <coughs> see, see, uh, walking, 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 and said, "Boys, stand up." So <laughs> they stand up 6 a.m. I said, "Let's go to see." So we go around the uh, lake. The, I don't know. Did we feel like what I I was feeling? Like I saw nature. I don't know, maybe we feel 15 years. But next day, I said, boys, wake up. I said, no, we're not going. <laughs> <laughs> enough of that. <laughs> it's enough for you. <laughs> we're going to sleep. OK. Grandma went by herself. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah, I woke myself. Did you drive out or fly out? No, we, by, by bus, bus too. Bus, by bus. OK. It was bus too, so I paid for. Where did you get on the bus at? Oh, it was because no, you no, cannot. Well, what town did you get on the bus at? It's David, city David, David, David? Dubuque, 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 Dubuque yeah. but uh, when you're going here, it's uh, no big uh, city, David, D E W E E T. Oh, D U S. Yes, yeah, yeah, David, yes. David, yeah. yes. So my friend took us for David, city. We sit in the bus and go to Chicago. Okay. Back, Tanya pick up us. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Sure. Got it. Because you cannot find here, it's awful in Marshall Town. Then, uh, seven years ago, you can find in YMCA different, different, different uh, tours, trips. Mm -hmm. Trips. I took a lot of from here. I went to uh, uh, where? Yes. Niagara Falls from here. Different, different. Chicago. You cannot find now. Hmm. It's awful. Well, I, I think they closed the bus depot down in yes. Marshalltown. Yes, yes, all closed. They got buses coming to Marshalltown, but they're all uh, no. From, they're all no. They do. They they're running from Mexico to Marshalltown. That's they do oh. two, a, First, two a day. Uh, yeah, but Texas. you cannot go and buy bus now. Uh, public bus uh, to Chicago now. No. No. no, it's done because I, when I came here first time, I went to Nashville from Marshalltown. It was awful, but I came uh, 20, uh, 24 hours from uh, Marshalltown oh, because I like to see America. I decided if I'm going on by bus, I will see America. But I didn't see America because we went for uh, highway. So what do you see? Nothing like only uh, maybe fields. That was. So yes, now you can go. Yeah. 
I don't know what the, after COVID maybe. I don't know. The um, the bank and trayer still takes trips. Oh, okay. In trail? Mm, trayer. Mm-hmm. Bank. The bank. Uh, mm-hmm. What name of bank? Um, farmers. Farmers Savings Bank and Trust. The corner of sixty-three okay. and eight. Tra- trust yeah. Bank. Trust Bank. Yeah. Because I know yeah. Trust Bank make the same tours in uh, Nashville. I one time yeah, I went to Nashville. Cindy Blaine used to be in charge of those tours. Okay. Yeah, yeah. she did. Yeah. Until just now, she just yeah. retired. Yeah. Yeah. It was very nice, but and I, I found it, but I no, it's long time to go almost to Dubuque. It's much better if you're going from here. Yeah, that's a pretty good drive to Dubuque. Yes, two hours, no, one hour and 30 yeah. minutes, like. Mm-hmm. The West, further south yeah. than Dubuque. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's named after you. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> named after DeWitt yes. Clinton. That, Maybe. Was his, that was the guy's first name. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Well, still, maybe you're named after DeWitt. <laughs> Grandpa was an orphan, so we don't know. Really? Mm-hmm. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. His, yeah. his mother died giving birth to him. Oh. And then his dad left and went out west, and Grandpa was raised by. Uh, his mother's, his grandma and grandpa on his mother's mm-hmm. side. Mm-hmm. But I did run into a girl up in Applington. Her her last name is DeWitt, Tony DeWitt. Oh, that was her maiden name. And she has some characteristics that I see in my sisters. Yeah. And, uh, so I we got to know each other, and I, I I was questioning her on on her. her. She goes back in the family further than me, and uh, see my great grandpa was Jesse DeWitt, the one that ran off, and uh, she she didn't think that was any of her relation, but she wasn't real sure. So I don't. Know. Yeah. There was that little clue. <laughs> but you can uh, you can take this the DNA. That's yeah. Is she mm-hmm. Yeah, my aunt did on dad's sister. She took a one of those tests, and it came back that we are uh, just a mutt. <laughs> well, mainly Scotch Irish, but but we've even got we're we're even West African. Yeah, mm-hmm. just everything. Mm-hmm. So. That's interesting. But if you have a name, yeah, so, could, so you can find oh, you can trace still it that trace way. your yeah. relatives that way. Yeah. Sherry started doing that. I don't know how far she got. She tell you she got. Oh <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. It's fine. It's fine. I'm okay with it. So anyway. Uh, Tonight we can start in Acts chapter 9 and the story of Saul's conversion and we'll uh, get started with that but we better ask God for some continued blessing because he, uh, he's been blessing us he, all the time. Yes, he has. All the time. For years. Thank you, God, for drawing near to uh, a small group of your followers and and uh, binding us together in a, with cords of love that, that we feel for each other as as brothers and sisters in Christ and this commonality that we have, this sense of family, although we're we're blood family, not even on the radar, but and some of us don't can't even trace our families past grandpa. But you draw us together. You, it, we are a family when we are uh, in your Son Jesus Christ, and, and we have that that deep sense of, of belonging. 
belonging to something uh, bigger and beyond each one of us and that is a, a sense that you you put in us to uh, draw us in that direction to to get near to to you to your power to your glory and to be satisfied in that and just be like a, a moth to a light and that's a good thing God because that's where we feel most alive it's where we feel most connected and the camaraderie that we we feel towards each other directed to you through your son Jesus is, is what we yearn for please God continue to to bless us in that way in Jesus name amen amen okay uh, Yeah, Acts chapter 9. How do you spell Ma? I can go M O T H, okay. but yeah. that's just my stupid phonics way of spelling that okay. Deb said ruined me. <laughs> Apparently, she's not a fan of phonics. Evidently not. But <laughs> Evidently it's, not. It's a good thing. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah, I well, would say. Don't get in an argument with my with, sister with because sister. you'll lose. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just remember that. Yeah. <laughs> don't bring up phonics. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> Unlikely. It served me well. It served me well. Yeah. Okay, Acts chapter 9, beginning in, let's see, I wrote down here a couple of weeks ago, 1 to 19, so we'll, I'll read that. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground and around his eyes, and although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight. He neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise, and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying, and he has seen a vision, a man named Ananias coming in and laying his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus has appeared to you on the road by which you have come and sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately 
something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened, and with power he went about doing good. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Okay. Well, there's a pretty dramatic account. Uh, it's recorded for the first time here, and then Paul retells it twice more in the book of Acts. Uh, and it's... Uh, A central and prominent instance in the, in the church. Because most of the New Testament we have was authored by Paul. And uh, a lot of the deepest insights that we have been given into uh, uh, God are from the pen of Paul. And he is a, a very important uh, and uh, I stopped when I said important. I don't think uh, that was the right word. He was a chosen servant of his Lord Jesus Christ. And he was used greatly and mightily mm -hmm. by God to uh, inform us. So could you say powerful? Yeah. Many of the most powerful images of God of our relationship to God were from Paul. Instead of important, could you use powerful? No, I used important and to refer to Paul, and then I couldn't say anything else. <laughs> that must not be a, the right word, so thank you, God, for for uh, guarding my mouth. So I, Paul would be offended for being referred to as important, apparently. Well, I wasn't thinking about Paul being important. I was thinking about or powerful I was thinking about what he says oh for absolutely us, for us to learn I just said it wrong <laughs> you <laughs> okay. said you said it right okay thank you so say it again so many of the most powerful <coughs> um, pieces of understanding about God and Christ come from Paul Come through, Paul. Come through, Paul. Yes. Correct. Okay. So we see here that uh, Paul is just on his merry way to uh, Damascus, just as. Uh, hot and hateful against Christians as ever. You remember that he was the uh, at the stoning of Stephen. He held the cloaks and approved of it. And uh, after that he became the uh, most uh, uh, prolific persecutor of the church. even to the extent that it says in verse 1 here of chapter 9 that Paul went to the high priest and asked for letters to continue his persecution. Mm -hmm. He wasn't being directed by the high priest. He was looking for more of a fight. And uh, in thinking of more ways to stamp out this this religion that that preached grace 
and I think that's uh, that was probably at the uh, was probably the nub of, of Paul's hatred uh, for the Christians was uh, that uh, justification was by grace alone was by faith alone through grace and uh, that was uh, went against everything that Paul stood for in his uh, uh, self-righteousness and his uh, working his way to God and that was that was a threat to that because if uh, justification, being right with God, uh, was solely outside of Paul and he couldn't do anything to affect that, then that just would be a tremendous blow to his worldview and he, he just couldn't stand for it. That just couldn't be. And we uh, that that is a that is a common thought that has carried on through the ages to this day. That uh, one of the most offensive things about Christianity is justification is by faith, by by grace through faith. People don't like to hear that. Because if they understand that correctly, that means it's all outside of their control. And if we're one thing that marks uh, all of fallen humanity is the, the need to be in control of something. Uh, who who wants that? All of that? fallen humanity. All of fallen humanity. All of those in Adam. Okay. Are uh, wants control and uh, if we can't have control over things in our lives, we settle for control over little things. But there, there's always this wanting to be in control, and if, if even even men locked up in prison that are controlled, their their lives are controlled down to the nth. You know, when can you go to the bathroom? Well, they're controlled by that, and they still want to be in control, so they'll form little little cliques and have their little hierarchies and. And uh, and the ones that are on the bottom of that, well, they'll they'll have their little control things, like they'll have to set everything in their cell in a certain way, and have control over this. Got to be this way, and, and it just that's just the way it is. We, we're the control. We we all lost humanity. All yearns to have control, and and we will adjust the level of our control to the. Uh, outside influences over our life and that's why you see a, a lot of people in in, in, uh, in uh, positions of power the, the thing driving them is they want control they want control and they have a lot of it well, in a lot of cases and that drives them for more but it's it's on that end and it's also on the end of the of the the fellow that's physically weak and beat up a lot in prison, he, he still wants to control something. So, just it's just the, the the nature. And so, what Paul is this wasn't unique to Paul here, breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. 
and he went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in the Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. That was, uh, yeah. Paul just happened to have more power, more control than a lot of people. And he was using it because against the threat he saw to his world view. But on his way to Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So just out of the, out of the blue, he's knocked to the ground by Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. And immediately, instead of being dazed and confused like you would think and, and, and uh, asking his buddies around him, what's going on? Did you see that? He, he, he doesn't do any of that. I mean, that's what I would have done, I would have thought. But Paul, he says, he answers that voice. And he answers it in a way that is quite telling. He says, who are you, Lord? Mm -hmm. He knew. Mm -hmm. He'd never seen Jesus. Mm -hmm. He'd never heard Jesus. And, but he knew. And he knew he was Lord. So he asked a question, but he phrased it in a way that revealed the answer. Who are you, Lord? And Jesus said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. So that's interesting too, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That he's uh, going to persecute Christians and Jesus says he's persecuting him, Jesus. So when uh, That's a good perspective for us to have as Christians when we undergo uh, persecution and trials is from Jesus' perspective that persecution is directed towards him. He takes it personally. Did you say that once more? It's that's a good thing to know that when we are persecuted as Christians, from Jesus' perspective, Jesus sees that as himself, as himself being persecuted. He takes it personally. It isn't like, well, those Christians out there are getting knocked around because they believe in me. No. He takes that as, yeah, I'm being persecuted in my because my my son or my daughter has been persecuted. And that might be a pretty good analogy if you want to, you know, like analogies are dangerous, you don't want to press them too far, but but if if one of our children are being, when, when, when they were little or in grade school and they were being picked on, that, that hurt, that hurt. That hurts to sit there and have your, your daughter cry about being picked on at school. I mean, that hurts at a personal level. Yeah. So, they, uh, like I said, analogies are dangerous, but that, that might be a close one. That might be a close. That, uh, how Jesus feels when, when uh, his church is being uh, persecuted. It's more than, it, it's not a detached awareness. I like that. Uh, uh, little line in, in Exodus. Hmm. I can find it. I 
which is three maybe. Uh, where's that at? Exodus 2, and it Exodus 2. Uh, during those, I'm, I'm beginning of verse 23. During those many days, the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, and God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham and Isaac and with Jacob. And here's, here's what the verse I was thinking of. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. God saw the people of Israel being persecuted, and God knew. That, that, and God knew that that's more than he just was aware. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, that's kind of what I was uh, getting at with, the, with Jesus there in... Uh, what being book was that in? Exodus and the chapter 2 Jesus being aware of his church's uh, persecutions on a personal level Jesus sees that and Jesus knew Jesus knows Jesus knows that's a that's comforting uh, and then we learn elsewhere that not only does he know but and he's uh, hurt on a personal level, but that uh, he's actually in control of that. There's uh, nothing outside of, of the Lord's control. That includes the persecution of the saints. There is there nothing is that befalls us, no persecution, no calamity that comes to us that is outside of God's control. In other words, there, there nothing happens by chance. Yeah, it's, it's directed by God for a purpose, God's purpose, that we more than likely do not understand. So this persecution that Saul was, was committing was not outside of God's control. And uh, that's not explicitly stated here, but it is very implicit because Saul was a chosen instrument of God from his birth. That's in Galatians. Yeah, Galatians one. In verse fifteen it says, But when he, God, who had set this is Paul speaking. But when God set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was re pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. So God had set Paul apart before he was born. So God was in, had a plan for Paul before Paul was ever born. And in time, he called him by his grace. 
and revealed his son to him. And our, I, well, I said it's implicit because are we to think that uh, in eternity past when Paul was set apart or set apart before his birth even, limited to that, between that instance and this instance on the road to Damascus, that Paul was just a loose cannon running around outside of God's will? That doesn't make any sense. God set him apart before he was born. So God was directing all his steps. And his steps from when he was born until this instance we just read about were mainly marked by persecuting Christians. Were really marked by... Were mainly marked by persecuting Christians. Paul was a great persecutor of the church. God was directing that. But he also, even earlier than that, directed Paul to be a great scholar of Judaism. Yeah. Yeah, he was yeah. preparing him. He was preparing him. Absolutely. By yes. being... Well, right. I wanted to focus on the persecution yeah. thing here because right. a lot of times we'll skip over that and say, no, no, God had nothing to do with that. The Bible begs to differ. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's a good point too, and, and that's that's very true. And I don't think there's any disagreement on that, that, that God was using that, uh, that great mind mm -hmm. that God made mm -hmm. and uh, that ability to to think and to uh, connect abstract ideas and and see things that mm -hmm. are not readily apparent and then put them together in something cohesive that that makes sense to us mm -hmm. 2000 years later yeah that was god's directing before mm -hmm. paul was ever a christian right he was he was learning he was, how to do yeah, those things. Yeah, he was honing those skills. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So Paul was uh, set apart before he was born. And uh, we see that. But Paul was still persecuting Christians and he was uh, uh, guilty and uh, liable for punishment for that. And that on one level was, was uh, outside of God's will. But that gets into the discussion of does God have one will or two wills? And uh, I would argue that along with Jonathan Edwards that God has two wills. And the will of his decree and the will of his command. And God commands us not to murder. But God decrees that Paul would murder. Okay. That God decrees that all would. I'm making the point along with, uh, I, this isn't original to me. The, I just, this is most clearly taught by Jonathan Edwards. He died 300 years ago. But that God has two wills. There's his will of uh, command. God says, you shall not murder, right? Mm -hmm. And there's his de will of decree. Mm -hmm. Paul will murder Christians. Oh. We don't know. We, we only know what God's will of decree by its effects, by it. Hindsight. All will, all will murder or Saul will murder? Same guy. I know, but what do I write down? I don't care. Saul. 
That's what I would think. Okay. Paul wouldn't do that, would he? He did, as Saul. As Saul, but not after his name was changed. No, his his nature was changed. And his name, right? Yeah, but his name was incidental. They could have well, yeah. called him Ebenezer. Okay. Yeah. But he would be a different person with a new name. Yeah, but it, no, not with it. the new name did not make him a different person. Jesus Christ made him a different person. Yes. Okay. I know. Okay. Okay. Just don't hang a lot on the name distinction. This is my point. Okay. So we have we have that. So Paul was, was definitely responsible and, and held accountable for his persecution of Christians. And no amount of his uh, doing good and uh, being obedient to all of the other laws would have any effect on that because righteousness is not by works of the law. Righteousness is by faith. And it's not our righteousness. It's the righteousness of Jesus Christ that God counts as ours. And that is what is most offensive to Paul and is most offensive to people today that hear that. But as Christians, on the other side of justification, when you correctly understand it, you you rest in that. It's a glorious thing. It's beyond words to know that, that you are justified before God. You are set right before God. I ask Pastor Gideon in Bible study last week. It was whatever last time we had. To tell me again when we are justified. Is it by faith? And he answered me, You will know when you feel it. You will know. But what? But I, I've heard you say that it's by faith. Right. But then there are a lot of people who don't really know the definition of faith. Well. So. Faith is, is not a difficult concept. It's a. It's just a. a A belief that belief in, in that God has done what he said he's going to do mm -hmm. to believe that mm -hmm. now that kind of faith is not something that we have in ourselves that faith is also a gift from God And so when Pastor Gideon said, you will know, well, that's faith. That's the faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Does that kind of clear that up? Mm -hmm. You will know. It's the assurance. Faith is that assurance of things hoped for. The thing hoped for is that we are justified by Jesus Christ's righteousness righteousness before a righteous and holy God and we will not suffer his wrath we have passed from death into life from condemnation into justification we are blessed in Jesus Christ and yes you you know that and that but that that can 
ebb and flow somewhat in our in our lives as we as we stumble along battling the residual sins that are in us our tendencies to uh, slip out of uh, or slip back into uh, sin uh, we got to restart we got to restart mm -hmm. correct okay all right Welcome see you in. soon see you soon to And the turn call said it's going to end. Well, guess what? Going to fire it up again. Yeah, they'll hug me in. But the moment they do, I got to. That was pretty quick on my, my part, but then not. Uh, yeah, then, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Hoped for. And we, yeah, we yeah. hope. Our hope is that we are justified with the righteousness, Jesus Christ's righteousness, which is outside of us. And we enter into God's presence as justified sinners. We're not condemned. We're not under wrath. We are saved. We are. Blessed, we are righteous, even though we sometimes in our in our saved state, in our stumble through life, being assaulted by every our culture. The TV, the books we read, the uh, person we bump into at the library. We, we get all these outside influences to calling us back to our, our old uh, sinful nature. And uh, that's, it's a battle. But faith says the battle's won. You're justified. You're righteous in Jesus and live like that. Become who you are. And we go on. And I don't I don't know what the what the what I use as an opposite to condemn, I probably won't be able to come up with that again. Okay. Let, can I say it again and see if I got right? Yeah. So justification is when we believe in the hope. Um, well, justification is outside of us. Yeah. I see now. I know that's true too. Yeah. How do we don't affect justification. Justification happens outside of us and apart from us. Okay, but and how does it we happen experience not it. to everybody? Well, no, not everybody's saved. But we experience that through faith. We experience that by believing that. And that faith is also a gift from God. Okay. God works that faith in us. Okay. And so that we, yeah, that's, that's good. I, I have Jesus' righteousness. I don't have to move one step to the right or one step to the left to be in God's favor. I'm standing in God's favor, justified right now with a righteousness that is not mine. It's outside of me completely. It's Jesus' righteousness. And I don't have to do anything. I can't improve on that. If I try to improve on that, I'm insulting my Savior. The only thing we need to do is believe and have if faith. you are justified you will believe you don't have to believe to be okay. justified 
if you are justified, you will believe. Because that justification, the, the belief is a gift that comes with the justification. Okay, but why doesn't he do that to everyone? You'll have to ask him when you get to heaven. God okay, does. Okay, that's a good answer. <laughs> yeah. I'm not God. I'm not wise enough to to, to make that. I, you, that's why you, you don't want me making decisions like that. That's what, why Gideon said. You will know when you are just. Okay. That's because the faith is part of God's grace but in justification. Not changed at all because he has two names. That's grace. All his two names, mm -hmm. and he was born. Mm -hmm. The faith his was is part of God's his... grace in mm -hmm. our justification. Mm -hmm. It's part of the package. When you're justified, you don't just God does doesn't justify you and then wait for you to gin up some faith to believe that before no, right. that the faith comes with the justification it's a package that he gives it to us absolutely yes and then we have the faith then we believe okay but faith is not a a, a work it's not a thing that we've got to do in order to be justified we have faith because we are justified so why does he justify some and not others? My answer is the same. Ask him. <laughs> I'm not making that decision. That's right. God's prerogative. Right. He yeah. is the Lord of the universe. It's up to him. Be yeah. thankful you are counted among his justified. And I know that. Or I'm also trying to make sure I say it right to the people that I want to tell. Okay. And somebody, if somebody says, well, I really want to believe that, that uh, uh, Jesus is my Savior and I'm right with God, but, but I, I, I can't. Is that the kind of people you're talking about? Or? They just don't know about it at all. Oh, well, then, okay. Then you got a blank slate. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. You don't have, there's there's that one obstacle you don't have to surmount then is false belief. Are you listening, Carolyn? If so if I can, we can talk about the words again. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Mike, that I don't remember him like I want to. Yeah. And, I can relate to that, Becky. And I don't want to say something that's wrong. Well, you can trust God to give you those words or to shut you up. You saw what he did to me about 15, 20 minutes ago, didn't you? I, could, I couldn't say another word. I wasn't trying to be dramatic or no I know I, I okay. there was nothing there to there was no words to be said until I realized okay I got to back up because I said the wrong thing trust God for that you'll do that you just witnessed it and yeah just rest in that and because we can we can sit around and wring our hands and and what if and and run all these scenarios endlessly and before we know it it's we're running these scenarios and less and less and we're getting further and further away from what was seemed to be so urgent last week and then pretty soon it's eh, and then we move on oh yeah, I'm, I'm about the king of that one, okay? <laughs> no, you're not. I, I've got a trophy for that one, and it's not a participation trophy. <laughs> I don't know about that. I've done that. But the more we uh, trust in, in a sovereign God to, uh, that he is in control, he will get done what he wants done, Yes. And, uh, but justification is a, is a big one. 
you see we we're seeing how big it is for Paul here this this is a big deal it's a big obstacle because the 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 person on the average person on the street uh, it's gonna one of the first things out of their mouth is gonna be what do I what do I have to do mm-hmm. we gotta do something well, we have to have trust. That's doing something. That's that's closely related to belief, which is closely related to faith, okay, yeah. which is a gift from God. Which is a gift from so I gotta write that. we don't slowly work our way towards faith by steps and works any more than we work our way towards justification by steps and works. They're both a gift. And that gift comes through God's word. So when we talk about these concepts, when we talk about the human condition as God has outlined it in in the scriptures, a good place to go is Romans. I am just... Well, I, I've just been soaking in Romans for a long time now, and I, I've come to love it more and more. But it says in there, faith comes by hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. What were you going to say? Sorry. I forgot. Well, it's the first, it's Romans 1. Romans 1. Justification. I know it's the part. Where does it talk about? It's right here at the beginning. I have to look at mine. Okay. Oh, yeah, you're probably easier to read than mine. Okay. Romans. You know, I'm taking it, taking time up, but not everybody needs to know. Oh no, we're going exactly the direction we need to go. Okay. No, oh, it's just a couple oh, pages thought, over I from Acts. Have... It's just, it's right here. Oh, okay. There you go. Romans five. Oh. Therefore. Since we are justified by faith. Yes. So we need to have faith. Mm -hmm. Which is a gift from God. Which is a gift from God. (laughs) And he just gives it to us when we trust him. No. He gives us to us. He gives it to us in order that we will trust him. Yes, it is. Don't make a mistake on that. Say it again. He gives us it to us. Gives faith to us in order that we will trust him. Faith. Well, why does he give it to us? So we'll trust him. Yeah, but why does he just give it to some of us? Does he give it faith to us? That, that's the question you were going to ask him when you get to heaven. Because we can't answer that. That's not up to us, and we don't know the answer. We don't know. But it says it's by faith. Justification. But, yeah. Yeah, but he gives us the faith, and he justifies us. But that doesn't say why he picks us and not somebody else 
and we don't know why. It's a gift. Just like you. Well, Becky, if, if you are going, I'll let you finish writing. And I'll give you a scripture, which is the closest scripture in the Bible that I know of that answers your question okay. that you've answered, asked four times now. It's not you not telling me right. It's me. No, that's no, that is a very legitimate question. When, when you think about these things deeply, that is the question that comes to your mind. It just does. And I, I'm i just saying here. What, tell me where you're reading. I'm reading in Romans chapter 9. Romans Begin, chapter 9. Beginning in verse 14. 14, okay. All right. Well, I'll back up. Verse 11. So. You're going where now? I just backed up to verse 11. 11. Okay. So he's talking, Paul is talking about uh, Jacob and Esau, the twins. Remember the twins? Yeah. Okay. So, in order that God's purpose of election, God's choice, why? Why does he not save everybody? His choice, his purpose of election, his choice. Mm -hmm. He elects some and not passes over others, okay? In order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, not anything that we do, but because of his call. She was told the older will serve the younger, as it was written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hate it. Okay. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? Why didn't he say why didn't he save everybody? That's the question. That's the question you've asked four times. Is there injustice on God's part? That's the right question to ask. That's what the question that Paul put in the Bible. Where are you now? Verse fourteen of Romans nine. So you're, you're asking the right question because that's a natural question that flows when you understand justification correctly. If you don't understand justification correctly, you won't ask this question. So that's a good sign. I want to know. That's a good sign. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? Paul says, by no means. And then you, you would maybe expect him to say, you misunderstood me completely. <laughs> he doesn't say that. Mm -hmm. He said, for, for he, God, says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So that's he's emphasizing God's freedom the in truth. election that's here. Truth. Mm -hmm. Only God's He's emphasizing that here. I will have mercy on whom I am mercy. I am. I am who I am. Exactly, Luba. If I will have mercy for you, I will have, if I will hate you, I will hate you. It's my choice. So then, it, the salvation, depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then, he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. Very hard teaching. Very hard teaching. Yeah, it is. He has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. You will say to me then, Here's another question. What, where are you now? 19. You will say to me then, so the, here's a way you can check yourself if you're following along here, if you're getting a right understanding, because the question that, that should arise in your mind after you read something that is so powerful and 
and jarring as that is, well, then why does he still find fault? Who can resist his will? If he does whatever he wants, if he has mercy on who he has mercy and he hardens on who, who he hardens, why does he blame me? Why does he still find fault? Who can resist his will? Who can resist his I'm just reading verse 19. This is in the Bible. This isn't Mike. Well, mine doesn't. I have, don't know why my Bible is so different. My 19 says, For just as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. Oh, you're, in, you're, in, uh, you're not in the right chapter. Go oh. to Romans 9. Okay, that's why. Okay, 9. 9, 9. Nine, nine, nineteen, nineteen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Nope, you're on the right page. Nine, nineteen. Okay, I found it. Okay. Okay. So if this question doesn't arise in your mind, you don't understand. You you need to go back and and read fifteen through eighteen again. Because that this should be the question okay. that that arises in your mind, and th and this is the questions you've been asking, Becky. So you're on the right track. Okay. You're tracking right with Paul here. That's a good place to be. Fifteen to nineteen. So then, Paul's answer then in verse twenty. But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to the molder, why have you made me like this? So Paul just has a rebuke here. Who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to the molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over, to the, over the clay, the potter being God, and the clay being humanity, to make out of the same lump one vessel for honored use and another for dishonorable use? Doesn't the potter have that right over the clay? Yeah, he does. What if? Okay. Here, this 22 for me is the closest answer in the Bible that I know of for that question. What if God desiring to show his wrath and make known his power. So God desires to show his wrath and make known his power, okay? Mm -hmm. So how is he going to do that? He has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. Read that one again. He has endured with much patience Vessel of vessels of wrath, people prepared for destruction in order to show his wrath and make known his power. But that's not the end of it. That's the beautiful thing. That's a step towards the end. The end is in verse 22 or 23. In order. Don't miss those two little words in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy which he has prepared beforehand for glory even us whom he has called love that that's that's hard that is very hard that's tough and people refuse to believe that even to the extent that Romans 9 is probably the least preached chapter in the Bible. But it's the clearest biblical uh, uh, explanation for the question that you have. And I'm, I will not go any further than that. because I'll expound on that, but I think that is, that is clear, like Luba said.
I am who God is. I am who I am. That's right out of Exodus, isn't it, Luba? Yeah. That's God's first encounter with these people through Moses. Tell them I am who I am. I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. And I will harden whom I will harden. So he just knows who we are becoming. Well, he knows who are we are becoming because he's forming us into that. He's well, the he's potter. He's not forming. He doesn't. Does he form bad people then? Everyone. Yeah. And now wait a minute. Oh, no, I don't think he's forming bad people. I mean, mm. it doesn't sound like. But it tells us what choose. to do. What? Who does he choose then? Oh, it's his choice. Because I'm not president, and he didn't know I'm not going to be president. He didn't choose me to be president. Uh -uh. God only can do it. Well, I, I understand what you're telling me, but I don't understand yet, yet how he chooses. Oh, that is right. in God. He does. His choice is found in him alone. It's not found in us. We don't know what we're supposed to be. He just makes us this way. That's what it says. He has the potter no right. I'm reading in verse 21 of chapter 9. Has the potter. God is the potter. Got that? Yeah. Has, has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump. The same lump being all of humanity. God is, he's using this analogy of a potter. God is a potter. Humanity is this one lump of clay. And has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honored use and another for dishonorable use? It's a rhetorical question. Yes, he does. He's the potter. So he makes us that way ahead of our life? I mean, we, we, of, from the beginning of time. Go on. I'm sorry. That's fine. Let's see. Verse 11 of chapter 9 though they were not yet born or had done nothing either good or bad okay. in order that another in order that in order that god's purpose god has a purpose before the before we are born before we have done anything good or bad god has a purpose his purpose of election might continue not because of works, nothing that we, we do or don't do, but because of his call. She was told, the older will serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I love, but Esau I hated. And these, this was before they were born. Again, our Our salvation is all out, our justification is all outside of ourselves. And as we saw last time, our condemnation is outside of us. We do enough to be condemned. Don't get me wrong there. But we are condemned in Adam. Remember we talked about that? We spent a lot of time on it. We are condemned already in Adam. Oh, sorry. Every everybody born yeah. is in Adam. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why uh, uh, that's 
that's the only uh, the only understanding that can make sense of of infants dying, miscarriages, and little kids before they were before they're old enough to know anything. They they, they die. Back in ancient times, uh, what was it? I think seven out of ten babies, children didn't live to be one. It's horrific, horrific. How do you explain that? They didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. They didn't do anything. But they were in Adam. Adam sinned, and death came in through that one sin. But we all are from Adam. Exactly. That's why we all die. Some die sooner than us. Mm -hmm. yeah. And for some, death is a gateway into paradise with Jesus. Like I believe all little babies are ushered into the presence of Jesus when they die. And for some, it's a shoved down into the pit of hell, deservedly so. Because not only are they condemned in Adam, they have lived a life worthy of condemnation. God doesn't make them sin. God never made me sin. I happily just ran headlong into a life of sin. And if I would have died in my sin, I would have went to hell, and I would have never crossed my mind to shake my bony finger at God's face and accused him of making me sin or creating me this way. Because deep down, I knew I was responsible for that. Yeah. It's, it's, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not going to say I've got all the answers and I can just button this all up. But uh, I think the longer you pray about this, the more you read the scriptures and ponder and pray over over these things, especially what we just went through in Romans nine then God will maybe not give you the understanding completely like he hasn't given me, but you will be at peace with that understanding and you will rest in the sovereignty of God and come to see that not as a horrible doctrine and something to be feared, but something to be grateful for and in awe of knowing that I am justified and happy 4th of July and he will keep me believing and give me the faith I need to persevere to the end and that is a wonderful thing to rest be able to rest in that and I wish, I want everybody to be able to rest in that. And it also puts us all on equal footing where we can go up, where we, we when we, when we realize our justification is outside of us and is not owing to us one smidgen at all then that gives it one of the biggest things that's given me I'll just speak I'll go outside of scripture and just speak one of the biggest things that's given me is a compassion for people I never had that before I was real quick to uh, uh, look down my nose and uh ignore and classify people along a scale. I was real quick to do that. I don't do that anymore to any 
God has blessed me to any degree that that I just don't do that anymore. I, that's one of the biggest marks of, of understanding that God's sovereignty and salvation is, is I have a compassion for everybody. Everybody. And because you can look at the most wretched soul. I mean, wretched in a loving way. And you can go, oh gosh, there's hope. There's hope for him. There's hope for her. Because justification does not rest on their doing. Because they can't and they won't. But God can and does. And I don't know. I've just been able to relate to, to people that way over the last several years. And, and that is a, it's, it's a great, this, this doctrine for me has been a great equalizer. And, um, Did you say compassion comes when we are justified? Or it did, it you did say, for me. I'm not saying that's, that, that, that God works that way for everybody because some people are just natu naturally compassionate people. You are one of those. You naturally have empathy for people. I never had that. I do now to some degree, probably not to your degree, but I do. And uh, that's a, that's been a marked change. So I'm not going to, that's why I preface that, that this is personal. This is not, I'm not making a blanket statement that if you don't have empathy for somebody after you've been justified more than you had before, then you're not justified. I'm not going to say that. No, no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that's what I have experienced. But I'm saying there, there's real evidence that feeds our faith that we have been justified. There's real tangible evidence that feeds that faith that you know. I think that's what Gideon was getting that's, at. That's what I'm thinking too. And I'm, he looked at me and he thought for a long time and then that's what he came up with. And I know what I read in Romans. And, and in Romans 5, it says, comes with faith. But it doesn't say about the gift. It does elsewhere. Yeah. Speaks of faith as a gift. But it, not in Romans 5, it didn't say that. Uh, mm, I don't think in that many words it did, no. I think you're right there. But again, you just can't pick a one verse out of Scripture and, and yeah. say, there you go, I yeah. just proved it. No. No, I, you, yeah, okay. You, yeah. You've got to take in the whole tenor because that's, that's, not what he's, that's not what he's getting at here. What he's, his main point in chapter 5 is to contrast our death in Adam and our life in Christ. And that is a gift. Right? Our life in Christ is, yeah. 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 Our death in Adam is a condemnation. Mm -hmm. It's not a gift. Oh my, okay.
Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9? Yeah. By grace you have been saved through faith. That's kind of like Romans 5, 1. Yeah. Yeah. And this is not of your own doing. Oh, okay. It is a gift from God. And that it is, it refers, you can see it in the Greek, I've been told, that it refers to the whole statement. The grace is a gift and the faith is a gift. They're both gifts. Mm -hmm. So there we have it fairly clear. Uh, Philippians 1.29 It says, For it has been granted to you. Okay, this is a gift from God. So what's the it? It has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe there's faith in him but also suffer for his sake so here's a clear statement that belief has been granted to those who believe would you read read it once more for it has been granted to you for the sake of Christ that you should not only believe in him but also suffer for his sake. Then we have Second Timothy. Two, twenty-four through twenty-six. What, what, what book? Second Timothy. Yeah. Chapter two, verses twenty-four through twenty-six. This is an account of a, uh, an exorcism, but it, it's kind of pertinent to what we're talking about, of faith being a gift, or repentance being a gift. It's the flip side of faith. The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness, God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of truth, and they may escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. That speaks of repentance as being granted by God. Like I said, repentance is the flip side of the coin of faith. They're really close. But repentance is granted. We don't do that on our own. Like, just like faith. Uh, Second Thessalonians, Chapter One. Verse 3, it says, we ought, this is something that we should do, 
always give thanks to God for you brothers as is right okay why because your faith is growing abundantly and if faith is something that we work our, in ourselves in order to earn justification or even to uh, get God's attention so he justifies us why would Paul say we ought we ought always to give thanks to God for that faith if we do it we ought to give thanks to the Thessalonians but he doesn't say that does he isn't that interesting these these little things that we read over so quickly and they're so profound this is the introduction to this short book of 2 Thessalonians. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly. And the love for every one of you, for each other, is increasing. So the love that we feel among each other, we should thank God for that not each other and the faith that we have to keep believing we should thank God for that not pat ourselves on the back yeah yeah and we're all in the same boat with that so we don't look for evidences of being receptive to generating faith in anyone everybody's on the same plane here nobody I mean nobody outside of the grace of God can believe nobody it's grace of God but that means the flip side of that is anybody can <laughs> Anybody can. Nobody's excluded. <laughs> Nobody's excluded by their intellect, their their circumstance, their depravity, their sin. Nobody is excluded. That's the great part. That's what that's where my empathy comes from when I realize that. Probably because I was one of those. And I, well, we didn't do anything I had written down, but I'm okay with that. You ask God, He provided. He's good in that way, isn't He? He certainly is. So, yes, unless somebody's got something pressing, we'll stop there. And uh, continue on in chapter 9 next time. I may have a, Bo may have a ball tournament next week. I, I think he does, but I, I also think it seems to me it's up in Charles City, so... I don't know if we're going to spend two days in Charles City next weekend or not. But, so I'll, I'll, you let us know. I'll email when I know what uh, Samantha's plans are. Mike? Yes? Um, I was able to listen to the church service today no it was a big thing last week about we couldn't do it but um uh, I, I think pastor gideon's sermons are all good but i thought this was exceptional maybe it was just because of what it was saying to me but one of the, the lines that i wrote down he said it a couple of times christian faith has everything to do with how we handle life 
and he was talking about well, he made the comment, because this is the title of a book, Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People? And a, a Christian, a true Christian, does do that, because it happened with me. I was raised in a, by Christian parents, most definitely. I was exposed to being in church and you know I knew I knew I thought I knew what a lot of it meant but it wasn't until I got involved in the Bible study that I really did uh, for one thing I didn't know what the book of life was how do I how do you go to a church for forever I mean, I, I, we were there every, I was there every Sunday. And it wasn't that they made me go, I wanted to go. And I didn't know what the Book of Life was. And the Book of Life states that before you're born, your name is either in the book or it's not. And, uh, oh. but until you're, for me, until I was born again, Uh, it being born again changed my outlook a lot, and it was pretty sudden. If I can, I can still remember when it happened. Uh, and I think some have said, "You know that moment. It's a feeling. Yeah, that, that might be a way to describe it. But from that moment on." I knew what joy was, and I knew that that's what I wanted. You know, I wanted to do that. I wanted to feel the joy like I felt at that moment for the rest of my life. And, and then, of course, Bible study helped a lot with this, but you don't have any hope if you don't have faith. Yeah. Uh, and he said that today too because I underlined it but I wrote it down uh, and then he also said I think we've said this God doesn't play favorites life happens and the, the difference is between a true Christian and a not true Christian is how you handle it uh and then you said the book, and it's been mentioned, mentioned tonight, and you pointed to verses that you have to love others before you can love yourself. You have to love others, and you have to, and that's something I, it, it my life experiences, especially with what went on with my folks and family members that did so much harm my folks. It's very difficult to love somebody that you watch destroy your parents' lives and not be able to, to, to help that person stop doing it. Uh, I, got, I did get past it. You know what I do now? I pray for them because and I don't know if, if they have but be born again, it's, it's rather difficult when you have Alzheimer's to do that. But I don't know. We aren't meant to know. Like you said, we aren't meant to know who's been chosen by God. But I thank God every day. So what would hinder God's hand from saving somebody that has Alzheimer's if salvation is justification is all outside of us nothing would hinder why would that be a hindrance to god it, it wouldn't be no but no. but for me to know it and it's, I've, not, I've not meant to know that doesn't mean i don't continue to pray for somebody because it's you know i know what this person was his entire life 
I lived it. And it's very difficult to, I mean, he, he hurt people. Uh, yeah. it, it's difficult to see that, but I don't know. Most of us do hurt people. Yeah. And we need to pray for ourselves that God would open our eyes to see how we have hurt people. Oh, and, well, that's happened to me. You can't, and then, you can't redo the past. And then out of that, if God in his mercy might grant us that, that compassion and empathy, and that's how we end up loving those who persecute us. And that's the part, like you said, it, it grows. It, uh, and it really helps a lot to grow in faith with other people. It, it, it's, it's, uh, if you're not growing in your faith, then you better question your faith. Yeah. 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 But it doesn't stop me from wanting faith, to grow. Faith, it doesn't stop faith. me from wanting, wanting to uh, try harder not to slip back. I'm not a gonna do it that's just life happens it just that's the way it's gonna be but i want to uh, i want to grow and 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 be better at not doing that you know at or stop doing it if i realize if i think okay you you're you're getting away from where where god Jesus taught us to be. You're getting away from that. Come back. You know, come back to it. Because he, God will always take you back. Once he's got a hold of you, he's not going to let go. No, but we've also got to ask him for that. Oh, well, the, the only way to, to do that is pray. Yeah. And, that's why you know, that's I emphasize we've got to pray that God would work that which we sense is lacking in us, that God will work that in us and not try and gin something up that's not in us in order to win God's approval because we already have that. And uh, God you can't, wants you us can't, to ask, ask you can't why. do Christianity. You've got to be a Christian. You can't do Christianity. You can do it. Yeah, I mean, Doing Christianity is not going to save your soul. Being a Christian does. And it's, it, it makes me really sad because I'm not very good with words. You know, I, maybe I'll get better. I pray I do. But uh, I'm just at a loss for words when, when somebody says something like, I, I just can't believe that. to me I'm, I can't believe you feel that way you know I don't I admit, I used to feel that way about things but I don't anymore and I'm so much happier you know I wish for you that you could have that happiness too because you can it's not hard to tell when somebody's miserable and I've got uh, she was a real good friend from high school, but she is so bitter and and so hateful of what the hand the hand she's been dealt is a big part of it. But I'm thinking, I mean, you don't have to think you don't have to think real hard at all to see she's miserable. She's just so miserable, and. I just, it makes me really sad to see that uh, and feel like I I don't know what to do I don't know what to say uh, it works I feel more comfortable around like prayer group people because they get it they know they know happens you know they have faith Therefore, they have hope, no matter how, no matter how bad things seem to get. Seem to get. There's, always 
there's always hope for a better day. And there always will be a better day. I don't know. Just, Maybe not in this life. Well, for sure, not in this life. Okay. When this life ends. Uh, this life is pretty much marked by misery and suffering. It is, but you can you can find a way to be happy. But the only way to do that is in Christ. Well, you're happy in Jesus Christ. That's a joy that, that uh, we can't put into words. It's just there in the midst of our suffering and calamity. But that doesn't, I, I, I hate to belittle suffering and calamity from anybody, but we, we still need to be compassionate and, and uh, have empathy for people who are suffering and in calamity and, and outside of, of, of Jesus Christ. And sometimes there's just no words and I, I, I think of that line from Forrest Gump when, when, uh, his, when Jenny goes back to that house she grew up in where her father molested her. And uh, she was so filled with rage that she just started picking up rocks off the road and throwing them at the house. And finally she and Forrest just stands there and finally there's there's no more rocks and Forrest has that line sometimes there's just not enough rocks and that's a good way to approach situations like that sometimes there's just not enough rocks and just to be with those people and, and, and not say anything <laughs> 